This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. And yes, we're back to the old camera angle from when I used to do these videos years ago on my webcam. And the reason it's on the webcam today is because I've got a very special guest joining me. Uh, what, what can I call him? Uh, you've seen him before. Bass player, uh, studio owner, producer, session musician, tour manager, and more importantly than that, um, one-time bass player with Shawaddy Waddy. This is, of course, Mr. Steve Hoggett. How are you, Steve? Really good, really good. Um, I know how you feel about the dry January thing, but I, I, I just feel it. But I, I do. You, well, you know I overindulge. I like a pint of binge. But uh, yes. feeling good. Um, struggling with the day job a little bit at the moment, um, but we'll see where that goes. I'm quite looking forward to doing this as well. I'm yeah, I better, tell, I better <laughs> tell people what we're doing. Um, there, there is a, a radio show on the BBC whose name I can't mention because they get quite protective about their copyright. But it's basically, it's basically, um, which eight records would you take with you if you were shipwrecked on a desert island? and as well as your eight records you're allowed a book and um one luxury to take with you as well and um given that we're both musicians and we regard having some form of making music maybe a guitar or whatever as a necessity we're going to kind of let let that one pass we can say you you can have that with you as well you're washed up on the desert island with your eight records a book a guitar or whatever, and one other luxury. And the only other change to the format that I've decided to make is we're not talking about individual songs, we're talking about albums. Uh, so eight albums that if you had to choose the eight albums you were gonna listen to for the rest of your life, what would they be? So do you wanna kick us off with your first choice, Steve? Um, uh, the first one was dead easy, kind of blue, Miles Davis. Um, okay. uh, early 20s, I actually, I went to see Miles Davis with one of the guys from when I was at college because he found out I was a bit of a getting into the music thing. Well, I already was and playing a bit of guitar and that. And he said, oh, come and come with us. We've got a spare ticket. We're all going there in the car. And uh, they had a bit of a booze before they went. I can't, I can't remember <laughs> when. I could dig out where it was because I can work out the year when I was at college and things. But then he disappeared off and then come back in the early 20s when... Um, it was when I got into discovered the modes, mm -hmm. and me uh, bass teacher at the time, uh, local bloke Tubby Ayton, said, "Oh, you want to have a listen to kind of blue? Cause it's all based around modal stuff," and it just stuck with me. It was played on repeat at my wedding reception thing. Great, great album. Oh, just there isn't a bad song on it. I, I, to be honest, John, what I and lovely listeners and watchers out there, um, the thing that that I took into consideration was because I've got, you know, I've been an old fart and that, there's that many albums kicking about that I was thinking, which doesn't have any bad tracks on for me? Yeah. <clears throat> and that helped me narrow it down a lot because I've got a lot of albums out there that were inspirational, but there was only maybe two or three songs on the album that were inspirational and they weren't singles. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from the the singly past as it were Aye. but uh that's uh that to be the number one great album uh kind of blue it may just that may not be the uh, the only mention of uh, that album that in this conversation spoiler alert um <laughs> so uh my first one um the shadows 20 oh, gold wow. rates okay now let me let me tell you why this is do you remember because you're a t-side lad you're about the same age as me. Do you remember, probably when you were a toddler, really, really young, there was a day on Teesside in the middle of summer when it just went as black as night? Yeah, yeah. You remember that, do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it was with the ICI, isn't it? Yeah, and um, I was being babysat by my granny at the time, and she was like a very, very strict Catholic, and she thought it was the end of days coming, you know, and she was freaking out. So, like, I started freaking out. The telly went off. I couldn't watch, like, Mary Mungo and Midge or whatever was on the telly, you know, because that went off. 
uh, but she had this big old pie radiogram in the front room. Class. And um, the only thing we could pick up was long wave on there. And uh, so she put that on just to have something to distract me, you know. And uh, on comes Apache. And I'd never heard music like that before. It was like, because when, when I think I was probably about two year old. And up to that point, your, your knowledge of music is like the wheels on the bus go round and round, you know. And I didn't know music could make me feel like that sound that was coming out of that little uh, pie radiogram could make me feel. And um, that's that, John. Just, and I was, quick, just a quick interject. I've got two that did that to me. But I was really? a little bit older, that feeling. Yeah. It's like I know what the feeling is. And I still get it now when I'm playing with a band and I still get it in the studio. And I, sometimes when you've got a mix, but that's the, 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 that, that feel, mm -hmm. that how it makes you feel. So I, I, I had a look around for uh, which album that originally occurred on. And it wasn't an album. It wasn't on any of their albums from the 60s. It didn't crop up on an album until uh, the 20 Golden Greats album uh, came out. Um, you know the one with the three kind of silhouettes of the shadows yeah, right, yeah, uh, guitars yeah. going up the wall. Um, so that would have to be my first album for that reason. It's it's the thing that probably made me fall in love with the sound of the guitar at a very early age. So what's your number two then, mate? Uh, this is where it all goes wrong. <laughs> um, I was already a fan of the band um, and been to see him a couple of times. But I'd when Ace of Spades come out, it was class. I was like, yeah, that's epic. I love it. I've just, for Christmas, I got me the, the, the 40th or 30th anniversary of it. And I still haven't played it yet, but I had to listen on the tube of you the other day. Cause I'm, I've got back into my vinyl thing. I know how you feel with the vinyl, but what it's done for me is I've got to make an effort to play the vinyl. Mm -hmm. I've got to put it on it's at the back of the studio and I can sit at the back and it's, I need to move my monitors so I can get a bit of a better stereo field at the back. But I sling a set of headphones back there as well and it's making me time out of it. However, when I heard No Sleep Time of Smith, um, it was absolutely epic. And what's even better, I was at the show, that one of the shows at the really? record. Yeah, so it was uh, Aces High or All the Aces or something to her. Um, and I'd gone to that with a couple of the lads from school. Um, but that that was, it kind of cemented Motorhead for me because they were doing something. I don't know whether I wanted it to be extreme. I love the aggression. I love the, it's like you hear Sabbath talk about growing up in like an industrial wasteland of Birmingham. I mean, we had that in Teesside. It's like in 1980, which was like the, the year before this, you, 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 if you left school in 1980, you were either going to work at Ed Wrightson's, British Steel, ITI, or some relatives company. Yep. You were going to um, sixth form. Anyway, that changed the, the next year. And this was an absolute game changer for me. And it was like, I always remember knocking about with the mate Chris Ozzy, and he had everything Motorhead had done. And we used to have um, competitions with a, a watch to name all the albums as quick yeah. as we could. And I, I think that was. Um, he was like, I don't understand you, don't understand you, you're going too fast. I was like, and it was like, made me conscious of my diction. And I think that helped a bit when I got into the noisier bands later on. But no, number two would be North Sleep till I'm a Smith. Right. Great. I mean, great live album. Um, one, of, one of the, you know, it's, uh, I did that video recently about, you know, about Dire Straits Alchemy. And I said, is this the best live album ever released? And there were a few candidates that I had on my list for that video. And um, No Sleep Slammer Smith was, was one of the ones that I considered. Anyway, on to my number two. Um, bit of a cliche, but it has to be on any list like this. Dark Side of the Moon. It's just... It is. It's just... <laughs> just with that one. It was, <laughs> I'm glad you've got that one in the, in the whole of the little episode thing. I, um, oh, is that what you would call an honourable mention on your list then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the honourable mention, I've just... It's like... But this is, I think, I can't remember if I mentioned it when we pressed the big red button or before mm -hmm. that. It was, it was um, the, I've, I like to love all the songs. Well, there's a couple on there I'm a bit like, with, okay. which, which is yeah, I know what you mean, John, but the, talk just about the, it, when you get to that, uh, it's just the whole sequencing of it. Um, 
you know, a track yeah. like On The Run, for example, doesn't work when you don't listen to it in the context of the album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And just you sit down, your headphones on, you know, with a big curly wire coming out of them, and um, headphones on, and you just listen to it as, as a complete piece. And it starts off with that heartbeat, doesn't it? And then you... Uh, you know, you're into the album, and then just the, the very fine. I'm getting goosebumps even as I say this now. Mm -hmm. um, that very final line of lyric, and the sun is eclipsed by the moon. You know, as you get to the end of the album, it just, you, it's like, um, it, it's bizarre because you know you've been told a story, and you know that you, you know that you know there's a narrative there. You're not quite sure what the plot of the story is. You're not quite sure what 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 story you're being told, but you know that there's been a beginning, a middle and an end, and you reach that end point there and you, you feel like you've, I don't know, it's its like you've, um, when you get to the closing credits of a really good movie that you've watched or something, it's its that kind of feeling for me with that album. To be honest, I don't know why I'm explaining myself, because if I have to explain why Dark Side of the Moon is such a great album, then, you know, you're never going to know, really. So that would be my number two. Um, a cool, a cool thing with that though, John. Just worth mentioning when we were in a bar and tacky is everything technical was looked after so well, from the actual recording of of everything on it. Um, I use one of the, the the songs on there that. Um, oh, I, I mean, you'll probably use money for the seven four thing, um, but the tape intro. People need to understand that the tape intro is in 7.4. And yeah. to do that, you know, in the 70s, before you had your digital technology, um, Alan, Parsons, Alan Parsons was sat there with a tape splicing it to yeah. make them all work and then to get them to work together cohesively. It's a massive technical thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw it, that interview with Alan Parsons where he was talking about how he did that and it was just... DMA, would, would any kind of modern band or studio um, bother? I don't know whether it would be the band. I think it was, he was so precious of it and thought, saw the idea and, you know, just cracked on with it um, and did it, you know, be, be other, I, don't, I don't know the full bit behind it, but it sounds like a work of, I'll do this and see if the lads like it. Yeah. You know, and that I'll do this, you know, probably took him half a day. You know, at least I would have said that. And in Abbey Road, then the rates would have been through the roof. But... Right. Do you want to go on to your um, number three? Number three is a weird one because um, it's always been floating around with me. I remember nicking off school to get this. Um, it's uh, and I, I'm playing in a band with the the drummer that was on this now, and that that's weird. It's uh, Welcome to Hell by Venom. Um, I thought. Uh, no sleep was heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, it was just a racket. Um, I had to sneak. The, my mum knew I'd got into the Venom thing and she didn't like all uh, the imagery around it and, uh, you know, the satanic inference <laughs> and things of stuff. And um, I just, it was just a racket. But... I love the energy. I loved how dark it went with, or it is with, uh, like lyrically. And then, like I say, I, you know, it's like I went through the the phase when I'd got to, um, I, I, I'd got to college, and it was like I wanted to look like Bray, Tony Bray, the drummer. And then roll on, you know. Years later, I sold the guy a sampler, and we met up at Easington Services, which is just off the A19 on the big road from the UK. And uh, he was coming over, and I thought, fucking hell, it's Abaddon. <laughs> and he goes, I know you. And I was like, shit, what have I done now? And uh, he said, uh, Ogget, isn't it Steve Ogget? I says, yeah. He said, uh, didn't you used to play with that car? I said, ah, I did, yeah. I said, oh, you know, we got chatting and that. Next thing I know, he's coming down the studio and I'm showing him how to use a sampler and thing. And the next thing I know, we've got a studio project on. Anyway, well, he had some bits going on and he ended up with a um, back reform and a, a, an instance of, of Venom called Venom Inc. Um, anyway, it all went a bit south for him. And we sat in the studio and he says, oh, 
when I've been touring around the world and that, because they toured everywhere, I think they did like 180 gigs in a year or something, hit every, virtually every continent. And uh, he says, oh, I want to go back to our roots. And the thing that he, he liked is he knew me punk background and me shouty mm -hmm. background. And next thing I know is I'm singing and playing bass in it. And the guitarist was playing guitar. Got the first rehearsal. I couldn't sing Countess Battery because I was crying. <laughs> so <laughs> is it true what they say about never meeting your heroes? Oh, no, not at all with him. I've met a few that were complete wankers. We were watching the Cream thing last night. And, um, I've had a, you know, a few drinks with Jack Bruce and the more that he got down his neck, the more of a belligerent twatty. Because, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the more, yeah, well, he did. But he was all right. He was just yeah. that proper, yeah, okay, the new Scottish, you know. Yeah. So they call him a t Tammy Shanter, the hat. Yeah. He just needed that. No, but musically, mm -hmm. um, when I come to play bass, me, that was like me two influencers that followed me along till I discovered Billy Sheehan, who I haven't got on the list that I've just remembered about now. <laughs> oh, we'll have to do another episode, Steve. Yeah, yeah, The Return. Uh, right, my number three, again, uh, probably says something about um, my um, advancing years. Most of these are from the 70s. <laughs> Looking at the list, I think they all are. But anyway, uh, Crime of the Century, Super Tramp. Um, love that album. Um, not as commercially successful, I think, as Breakfast in America, but I think, I mean, Breakfast in America is a good album. But Crime of the Century, I just think, is is just better. Just every, oh, It's like everything is just that little bit better. I mean, you play me a better track than Hide in Your Shell. You know, a f fantastic track. You know, just those quiet kind of keyboardy intros with Roger Hodgson's kind of quite high falsetto voice and then just the, this epic outro that it, it kind of builds up to fantastic album and that's just one track off it um but again like you were saying there's not a track there that i feel i need to go any, anywhere near the skip button it's just um you know you've got uh bloody well right school rudy asylum you know just it, every track is just epic and um I, I love that album i will never ever tire of listening to it which is why it's on this list very good. So, uh, your number four. Uh, it's Blokey Not Too Fond on, and I don't know whether you've heard this album because it's got singing on. Um, that you should definitely give a go. Um, I'll, I'll send you a link after it. Alan Oldworth. Um, this, uh, it was an easy introduction to me because of the singing on it. Mm -hmm. um, the guitar playing, I was. <laughs> I'd never, it was like it eclipsed what I'd heard when I first heard Eruption. And uh, it, it, I loved that. I, I like when I kicked off, mm -hmm. I kicked off playing in 1981. And um, I loved the wiggly, fast stuff. And I, I, I ended up being a, a boy of the 80s, both on guitar and the bass thing. It wasn't until I had a daft accident in 2002 that I found some. Uh, I seem to be more conscious of having a decent tone and playing with some kind of feel. But um, metal fatigue was, um, I always remember going around my mate, Kev Smith, and he put, he put it on, you need to hear. Uh, sadly, no longer with us, Kev. Um, he put it on, but then he played along with it. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I can't remember the year, and it was like, What? And it suddenly he was Kev was one of these local guitarists that people started to take notice of. But we were kids. Um, but the metal fatigue thing with Oldsworth, there was a few things. Uh, Jimmy Johnson's bass tone spoke to me loads because I'd had Kronos's bass tone, this big fat racket thing. Um, he was playing a note while he sang Lemmy's distorted racket, which I still love and I still kind of bass what I do, but. Jimmy Johnson's bass tone was very middly, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, the the bass spoke. I mean, I've even got Jacko on here because if it, if Holiday for Pans was wasn't on the first Jacko album, it would have been on here. Um, but Metal Fatigue, there isn't a song on that I, I dislike, and it was um, getting a, a ah, getting to meet your heroes. I went to see him sound check when they played the Dovecote, which is like an arts venue in Stockton, in uh, in Teesside. And 
took him for a pint to the sun. Um, and he was just so, he didn't want to leave when he tried the bass in there. It was class, you know what I mean? It was like, I remember um, oh, Stewie, what's his name? It was the gaffer in there. I got a bit of a talent off because our Alan had had um, three or four pints um, before a gig. And it's like it, the tour manager had said, try and keep him away from the ale because, you know, unfortunately, that was one of the reasons why we didn't get a big output from Alan as he liked to. And they good album, though. And definitely one for you to have a listen to, John. I shall no. give it a try. I, I, the first Holdsworth album I tried was Secrets, and he was going through his Syntax phase at the time. Yeah, I uh, struggled with that. It was hard work, yeah. And and I just I didn't get it. And then I tried some of his later albums. What was it, 16 Men of Tain? Yeah. Um, and it just seemed to be... it. It was one of those weird things. It ticks all my boxes. Great guitar playing, jazzy chord changes... Um, you know, virtuoso musicianship all round, and yet it just didn't kind of set the hairs on the back of my neck. Uh, like, you know, it just didn't if, really kind of do it. If that had been the introduction, if I did uh, Tavacrom first, mm -hmm. um, I'd have probably been in the same boat with you because one of the things that I have is it's that first impression stays with me, yeah. though, and sometimes I take a bit of corks and round. Right, my number four. Um, now, this is a bit of a twofer, this one, because I had to have a Thin Lizzy album. Oh, class, yeah. And I had to have a Gary Moore album. Oh, and yeah. as I was kind of narrowing the list down, it was like, w there was a kind of, you know, tick one box only moment. So I've gone for Black Rose, Thin Lizzy. I think it's, I mean, Gary's guitar playing on that album is the best, I think, possibly with the exception of Still Got the Blues, um, the best his playing ever got. Um, I think the title track from that album, if the record company had had the stones to release that as a single, it would have been as big an iconic a track as Bohemian Rhapsody. I really do, because it's that same sort of epic, but in a completely different way. Um, and, you know, again, another album where you just never want to skip a track. Uh, Waiting for an Alibi, uh, with love, you well, know. Maybe I was. I didn't know. <laughs> I love dyslexia, me. <laughs> you know, but you know, just a great, great album. The only thing that lets that album down is the is the cover art. If you look at the kind of really crap painting of the band, that's I think it's either on the back or on the inner sleeve on the vinyl. Um, it's just like you know, it was it was like it was done by um, you know. Um, a CSE grade two art student, you know, it was, it's not a great picture, but that aside, John, the music can, is, can, can I just pop, pop in with that? Yeah. I've only been interested in the artwork the past two years. Yeah. I wasn't interested in the slightest, and I never thought of the package. And I remember when I was working for a, a bloke at Precord Audio Products called him Brody Fry, and he said, he always pushed to me that your packaging is as important as what's in the package. He said, you can sell shit if it's in a nice box. Mm -hmm. And it only really clicked with me a couple of years ago, that. And I think what you've got there, of the, especially with the vinyl thing, of the whole package that you're buying. Mm -hmm. um, I bought Cry for the Nation by Schenker because mm -hmm. of the electric chair thing on the front. Yeah. And here I am saying, I, I was never really bothered about the artwork. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted. No, no, I mean, it's to me, it is, it's the best album Thin Lizzy ever did. Um, like you were saying earlier, it's the only album of theirs where I never want to skip a track. Um, and I discovered it in when I was at college, you know, um, the, the first Gary Moore album I actually heard was Victims of the Future. That's when I started getting into him and then sort of went back over. So about probably about 85, 86, I probably discovered uh, the Black Rose album. And I remember it was well while Phil was still alive. And uh, just just remember discovering that and discovering, oh, that's that Gary Moore bloke I've just got into as well. He's playing on this. And, you know, just, just a fantastic, brilliantly produced album, it has to be said, um, certainly to my non-producer ears anyway. And... Um, yeah, you know, just great guitar playing, great songs, great album that works as a as a kind of complete thing. You know, you you never want to skip a track. So that would be my number four. What's yours? My number five 
Oh, sorry, yeah, number five. Yeah. I'll let you off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just, just while I was in the shower, mm -hmm. completely forgot about these. It's a, a, a band that will probably be brand new to most of your listeners. They're an American band called The Descendants. Um, and the album's called Cool To Be You. Uh, they are a punk band. This was, I think, 84, 85, something like that. It sounds like it could have been released yesterday. Um, the songs are so strong. Um, a lot of the American-style punk got taken off my radar by myself because being in uh, Riot Act and then joining uh, the Space Frogs, which would have been... 92 to kind of 95 uh, right right i think we're together from 92 i don't know i've got the date somewhere but we were like uh it's when guns and roses were making a big thing and we were quite we were rock and rolly um but i was bringing i, I just left hardcore um because we weren't gigging enough um and the descendants were a band that i kind of um put on the shelf because I was writing so many songs that were that American punk kind of thing, that I didn't I didn't want to go down that route because I saw the start of Green Day and that was already getting nailed and I didn't really want well the guys in in Riot Act didn't want Riot Act to be a, a punk band per se, um, and then with the Frogs I, I got such a shock when I found out that Bugsy was a songwriter but the Descendants had back with me now i think they were my number one played band on my spotify playlist last year i uh, should check them out because they're a new one on me yeah oh the songwriting's incredible lyrically brilliant really really there's loads and loads of chord substitution going on in uh and reharmonization of like a simple one six four five progression mm -hmm. really clever stuff which is not something you tend to expect in punk is it now, the yank punk you get a bit more of it um or the very angsty lyrics well they're kind of both but very clever um there's a song called american uh lyrically just class i should have written a couple of that and um, my daughter's favorite band as well just they were hearing them in the band all the time and it's like she put a spotify playlist together and i got a bit of a shock when i saw that for a you know, when she put the playlist together, she was nine and she even had Tom Waits on there, you know. <laughs> I was like, I haven't done a bad job here, you know. No, no, <laughs> raise them that way. Yeah. Uh, right, my next one, my, my number five. Um, again, uh, another one that I can't live without. Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs by Derek and the Dominoes. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's... I mean, the, 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 the sort of circumstances of that album are well documented, but for anyone who doesn't know, basically, um, Eric Clapton, uh, who was like, who was Derek in Derek and the Dominoes, let's face it, um, he was head over heels in love with his best friend's wife, uh, George Harrison's wife, Patty, uh, Patty Boyd. And this album is just all of that kind of angst and unrequited love. Uh, well, it wasn't. It didn't end up unrequited because they ended up getting married, and George Harrison was the best man at their wedding. Um, weird that, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, obviously the title track, but you know, um, just so, people talk about the um, that album that Clapton did with John Mill, the Beano album, um, as being you know a defining moment, and it, it kind of was, I suppose. You know, if I could have played like that when I was 19, you know. Do you know I've um, never heard all the Beano album through? Have you not? No. Oh, no. I I'm promising to, to give it a sit down to listen through. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I I kind of, with retrospect, I think Eric's playing is, is very much a work in progress on that album. And it's, I think it was the, the Cream years where he kind of, where he was, you know, kind of hanging out with Jack Bruce that brought him on a lot as a musician because yeah. you can hear his playing is a lot more mature and, you know, he's kind of playing to the chord changes a lot more on the Layla album. Songs like Key to the Highway, Have You Ever Loved a Woman, uh, Any Day, Bell Bottom Blues. I mean, just fantastic again. Song after song after song after song after song. It's a double album as well, which is... That's something of a of a feat, I think. It, it's all it's one thing to make a single album, you know, like um, what we used to call the two sides, uh, that that 
has no kind of weak spots on it. But to do that across a double album, I think, is is even more of an achievement. And it's just some of the... If you like electric, sleazy blues guitar playing, um, where you can smell the whiskey fumes and the cigarette smoke, then it's it's just an album that needs to be checked out. So there you go. Layla and other assorted love songs. That would be my number one, two, three, four, five. So I guess we're on to your number six. Um, it's where the racket started. It was uh, Slayer, Rain and Blood. Um, <laughs> we just, we had a, a sniff from uh, an American label when I was in Hardcore around, it was about 87. And um, they got in touch with a UK label uh, called Metalworks and then Metalworks decided that they were going to sign it and do stuff. And I remember taking um, Rain and Blood into the studio um, and it was bonkers because the monitor system that they had in the studio, I said to the studio owner, I said, uh, can I come back and have a listen to the old album through the speakers, please? And uh, he said, oh, yeah, no bother. He said, uh, I'd be interested to hear it if that's what you're doing. And even better than that, um, the waterfront was literally, the bar in the waterfront was literally 20, 30 steps away <laughs> from where the mixing console was. Uh, so I went over and ended up having a really good um, relationship with the owner, still in touch now. Um, and did, we did the Hard Car album there, but with the Rain and Blood thing, the thing that was a shock to me is it didn't sound like a metal album. It sounded like a hardcore punk album, which is my root, really. Um, and it, I think it's 28 minutes long. But because it's 28 minutes long, the va it presses really well. So all even on a crap pressing, because there's not much music t in time, in length on it, it was it was class. Um, I was grown out of the nails and the studs and the leather thing a little bit by then, but... Um, I still use it as a as a go to. Actually, I've just nicked a couple of ideas off Rain and Blood for a mix I did for an Abaddon song that's coming out on a compilation where they do the uh, the Van Halen thing where you have the guitar coming out on one side and you have the reverb of that guitar coming out the other side. Um, and I always remember asking um, about when I was at the mill, I worked with a guy called Mick Elker who was uh, he was a runner for Roy Thomas Baker. And he gives loads of little tips on if you want to do like to power that massive, big, dead, dense sound. He said all the guitars he did, he did a similar thing, or it would be like because uh, it was the eighties, it would be a chorus get down the other side. But yeah, Slayer of a lot to answer for. <laughs> right then, on to my next one. Um, it's the only album on the list. Looking at this list, that isn't from the seventies. Um, <laughs> it's it's from before that. <laughs> um, I've mentioned this already from 1959, Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. Oh, cool. Um, it was actually a toss up between um, this album and an album that came out the year before, uh, Cannonball Adderley's Something Else. Oh, class. Which is pretty much the same lineup uh, yeah. on that album. Um, I don't think Coltrane is on the Cannonball Adderley album, but, you know, it's. I think it's pretty much the same lineup otherwise. Um, and everything you said earlier, you know, uh, about it, I would just echo that it's, um, don't you, know. you want to say, don't you want to say it's really well written and it's not written at all. <laughs> it's no, it's just, just yeah, it's, you know, it's, I mean, there, there's a lot of sort of urban myths about this album, about how they went into the studio with no ideas and it just, just what came out, came out. That's not strictly true. No, it's not. No. Um, you know, there were a few kind of uh, sketches of, of basic riffs and stuff, but it is basically like, okay, let's just set up a groove and, and jam. And, um, you know, the, the, I mean, it's just, what can I tell you about it? It's just a fantastic, that, that opening track, So What, the way that that just, that riff just appears out of the mist. It's just, you know, a fantastic. Album. 1959 was, was something of a year for jazz, wasn't it? Because you had yeah, that yeah. album and you had Mingus uh, um, and you had, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I trapped myself through for Christmas. It's, um, Two CDs and a DVD, and it's got all the different recordings on. Sorry, I, 
no. But you know that that year, fifty nine, you had um, kind of blue. You had Mingus. Uh, um, you had what was that Ornette Coleman album? Um, Shape of Jazz to Come. Um, not one of my favourite albums. It has to be said. I have to be in the right mood to listen to that. But um, it can be a hard listen. That it's yeah. clever, dead clever. But you know, kind of blue. It's. Did you know it was Dwayne Allman's favourite album? No, not at all. That's weird. I bet there's a load of people that it's kicking about with. And you, you you listen, oh, just you listen, noodles and oodles of feel and groove, you know. I mean, take a listen to, uh, well, another album that almost made this list, um, the, the Allman Brothers Live at the Fillmore, and take mm -hmm. a listen to In Memory of El Elizabeth Reed from that album. And you can definitely hear, I think, on their, you know, strong influences from Kind of Blue on, on uh, that track. Anyway, so... Did you ever come blue. across um, any of the stuff he did with that bass player called Foley who played a piccolo bass? No. Uh, that's I, I, did. I discovered him on... Um, it was one of them. You remember the Flexi Discs that you got with Guitar Player magazine? Uh -huh. He was on one of them and he'd done like a, a Foley's track. Obviously, it was the 80s and it was a load of shred thing, but it was just so cool. I mean, it's like when you look at... Um, I mean, I'm absolutely Miles Davis mad. Um, and it, it he's like... Super, just but I can imagine being hard, hard work. Yeah, hard work. Robin Ford. Because I, I read, I, I think I saw an interview with Robin Ford where, um, you know, exactly he echoed that exact sentiment. He says, Great musically on stage, great. He said, but you know, um, you know, touring with the guy, it was incredibly was, racist as well. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, that. I've never had that racist thing going. I've always had. I've always found it weird as well. You know, else we cut us all. We bleed the same. You know. Anyway, sorry. right. So that would be my uh, number six. What's uh, what's your next one? Um, I need. I really need to glue two together here. Okay. Um, I can allow that. Um, because we all used to go around the mate's house when we were. Maybe 16, 17 ish. I was trying to think of the year, but um, it was more two albums that influenced me as a player because I tried to learn both albums. Um, and there was four albums together, but the two that really stuck out were um, Iron Maiden Killers that I, I, I just adored. And I started learning all the finger style stuff on the bass. Um, Steve McDonough had a fresher. Um, P bass copy with flats on it that was um they were made in the same factory as CSL basses, so it was a good bass and he had a do you remember custom sound trucker? Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> um and I would play with this and they would all be the rest of the guys would be downstairs watching um horror movies and that and I'd wait like my fingers were all dead so I'd come down and we would have like we would get uh, there was, when I say loads there was maybe 10 12 of us and we'd get like two crates in Newcastle Amber uh and just share them with ourselves but I, I wanted to, to glue the two together the other album was uh, an album by Stiff Little Fingers called Hanks um and that that it it the guys who were downstairs watching all the things were really we were two kind of separate groups of mates that all knew stay um and he just loved good music but he loved the punk thing and he he'd gone into the metal thing uh, a lot later on because he was around for the 1977 punk thing mm -hmm. um but it was the, the t two albums that would be uh killers iron maiden and uh S hanks by so like one of me uh, it's like the you mentioned meeting your heroes i've got a complete like opposite end of the scale for meeting um the 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 lads uh, who play in XSL um I, he's like a mate now and it, it's like i send him stuff that i'm working on and he he sends us henry clooney um sends me stuff back that you know he's like you know a really good feedback as well i mean i think he did the journalist thing i know he had a radio show but he's like Gives you proper feedback on stuff, which is really cool. I'm sorry I had to glue them two together. No, no, it's all right, mate. We, we can allow that. Yeah. Um, right, my penultimate choice, again, back in the 70s. Um, a band who I think um, should be better known, uh, Camel. Uh, 
the oh, snow right. goose. Yeah. Um, now, how I how I discovered this album was, for people who don't know, the snow goose is um, kind of a, a novella by uh, an author called Paul Gallico. And I won't bore you with the story here. It's it's, it's um, just basically, it's longer than a short story, but shorter than a novel. And you can read the whole story in about an hour or so. And what Camel did was they decided that they were going to do a soundtrack for the book. Oh, nice. So, mm -hmm. you, can, so you can listen, if, depending on your speed of reading, but for the average speed that most people read at, you can put the album on, read the book, and the, the, the album serves as a soundtrack to the book. And that's how I discovered it. My old English teacher at school, Mr. Levan, he was called, um, he used to do stuff like this. And he put this album on, and we can as a class, double English, one Thursday afternoon, I seem to recall, we um, we went through the book and with the album on in the background. And, um, you know, I don't know if anybody else in the class got turned on to that album then, uh, but that was my first experience of listening to Camel. And, you know, from all up to about, I think it was 1979, 1980, because, uh, again, this was another one of those bands where I sort of went back because uh, this was kind of probably 82, 83 when, when we did this. So I went back and discovered their, their disc discography, as we now call it, um, in the 70s. And the, the first few albums like Mirage and Moon Madness and Snow Goose and stuff, all the way up to um, I Can See Your House From Here. Um, great, 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 great. Yeah. Great, 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 fantastic albums. And then... They just seem to become in the eighties more of a sort of a plodding FM AOR ballady kind of yeah, you know power yeah, ballad yeah. style band, which I sort of lost interest after that. But the Snow Goose, it's all instrumental album, um, no singing on brave it. Brave that, yeah, brave that. Um, yeah. it took me four listens to read through, like. It, sorry, <laughs> it took me four listens. I was dyslexic as. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's to me, it's it's as good as Dark Side of the Moon, and it deserves to be thought of in those terms as being that important an album. And I never ever tire of hearing it. So there you go. Another album where none of the tracks really make much sense outside of the context of the album. Maybe a couple, but you know, it's just you you need to listen to it as a complete work. So the Snow Goose by Camel. That's my penultimate choice. What's your final one, mate? Uh, Frank Zappa. <laughs> Which one? Um, Broadway, the hard way. Um, I think long and hard for about 30 seconds with this, because that was... I, I'd heard loads of Zappa. Um, growing up around the guys who I knocked about with, I'd loads and loads of Zappa. But it was the first Zappa that I got straight away. Um, by the time I heard this, I was into more of my politically punk hardcore roots in a lot more depth and things. And it was like, uh, and I just loved some of the, like, rhyming man. Um, it just, uh, it dead clever, you know, lyrically. Um, and then when I found, as I got more into him, um, I had my entire Zappa collection stolen when I was in my, my flat. They're all vinyl as well. Um, there's a few signed Zappa stuff as well. I didn't get them signed, like, because uh, I got them at record fair. Uh, I did lucky enough to see him live. Um, just off the chart. Actually, I didn't even know I've got my Zappa t shirt on. There you go, the man himself. <laughs> I was just, it was, I was thinking earlier on, I was like, I'm not going to change it because. Um, where this T-shirt come from is a few years ago that uh, Alex Webster of Bill and Ted fame mm -hmm. um, started a crowdfunding uh, project to digitise all the, the work that he has in the utility muffin research kitchen that's his studio. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go on and have a look at like everything that was in there, really. Um, uh, he put his house up, uh, the, the Zappa house went up for sale, obviously, when he... He passed on. Lady Gaga's got it now. But the thing with Zappa and Broadway the hard way is I couldn't 
I couldn't get my head around how they could be so true stylistically when playing the whole of the album and it's live. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I'd seen him live, he did these like hand signals, I'd make sure it's see that he would go playing his guitar, noodle, 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 stood up and it's like noodle, 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 and he would go like that. And they would turn they would turn the same song into a scar feel. Like I can't click my fingers, click. Um on the drop of a hat. It was incredible. Um but Broadway, the hard way. It was a great introduction. And then I, I went back. That was around. When we were recording the Art Car album, it was one of the CDs that was in the studio. So um, we had these massive um, Tano Super Bowls that there was just so much detail and you could hear everything. It was like, you, you know, you'd put songs on and you'd like, where did that come from? I didn't know that was even there in layers of harmonies. And, but... Our Frank, number eight, the one. Do you, do you know, the, just just before we move on to my final one, do you know the uh, the story that Steve Vai tells about his audition for Frank? Oh, go on. Um, well, he's there. He's 18 years old, Steve Vai, you know, and um, Frank says, okay, play this lick. So Steve looks at it and says, plays the lick. And he um, says, okay, now play it with a reggae feel. So oh, he kind of plays it with a reggae feel. He says, right, now play it backwards. And he plays it plays it backwards. Now play it backwards with a reggae feel. Plays it backwards with a reggae feel. He says, right, now play it in 7-8 time. And Vi goes, Frank, I can't do that. It's just, it's you know, it's impossible. There's not enough space in the bar to kind of put that into 7-8 time. And Frank looks down, looks down his nose at uh, the young Steve Vi and he says, you know, I hear Linda Ronstadt's looking for a guitar player. <laughs> Yeah. The um oh what's his name with the massive drum kit when he went for uh um oh, the huge kit what they call him absolutely incredible drummer um and he did the black page as an audition he'd give all all the drummers who were um going for the, it's gonna come back to me and then you'll have to put a thing up if one like oh shit what they call him uh huge kit and they were setting up he had in his studio the utility muffin research kitchen he had one drum kit on one side of the room um that you would the, i don't know whether they set him up while zappa was talking to him and another one you know, but they had to read it so it's like you didn't wow. learn the black page you read it um and uh he was by all accounts he was the only drummer who got right through it um Oh, what an incredible track. I remember his name. God, come on. It'll come to you. It will, yeah. About five days' time. Anyway, um, my, my final one. Um, again, it could have been any album by this band. Well, almost any album by this band. But I decided to go with the uh, the Origins. Can't buy a thrill. Steely Dan. Oh, wow. I completely forgot about them. <laughs> Um, again, you know, um, just the whole ensemble piece as an album, you know, you start off with, uh, do it again, uh, dirty work. And then you, you know, you're moving on through, um, you know, reeling in the years, turn that heartbeat over again, you know, just I track after track after track that it, that just make you think. It, it's all it, it, another test I always have is if I'm in a hurry, if I've got to be somewhere or if I've got to do something and I'm listening to an album, will I make myself late just to, yeah. get, just oh, to kind of get to the end of the album? And that's oh, definitely God. an album that yeah. that will happen yeah. with. Can, can I just have a quick interjection while we're talking with Steely Dan? Go on. Um, Leander was about four and um, she's listening to stuff and I'd, I'd had uh, Asia on in the the van for quite a while and she's at the the cooker janice cooking away and she's looking what's going on and that and she says uh, put that song on put the song on beige on i was like beige on i said i was like thinking and she sang it she went beige on i said you mean asia <laughs> <laughs> that's the one it's class um but it's some of the stuff that they've done separately i think um you know, our 
our Walter is, um, I like what he does, but it's like you could see where all the real sensibilities come from. The Nightfly was a good album. Ah, oh, Donald Fagan, amazing. But I'm off the cat. Was um, yeah. I, I used that when I was um, still doing live sound. I used um, uh, the song "Morph the Cat" for setting the rig up because the dynamic range of it is so cool. I mean, uh, just assembled the best of the best for it. But well done with the Steely Dan, another one that I completely missed off the list. <laughs> Right, so I think we've both got through eight albums now, and um, I'm sure that we could always have second thoughts and think, well, uh, why why didn't I include that? But I'd be happy to be shipwrecked with those um, with those eight albums. I think that would give me enough scope uh, to listen to for you know on my desert island. Uh, so the other two things that we need are, um, as I say, a book. And a luxury that isn't a musical instrument because that's a given. <laughs> have one of those anyway. So a book, Steve. Uh, uh, the book, the book one's dead easy. Um, uh, um, if I'm allowed a musicy book, I think it will be the Guitar Handbook by Ralph Denyer. Um, purely and simply, every time I open it, I learn something new. Yeah. Every time I open it, it's so well written, so well put together. Yeah. Um, it's awful when you start in your 50s. Another chap who sadly passed away, Mike Franklin, um, give me his copy because it was the second one mm -hmm. um, that it had, you know, it had a big SSL console bit in and all that. And he said, oh, you'd have it. He says, it does my head in. Makes me feel it. I think the words he used were inadequate. And it was like, look at it. Mike was so fucking talented. It was off the chart, you know what I mean? But um, that was great. If I had to have a non-music one, I think it's a recent book by a guy called John Joseph. He was the singer, but still is a singer with the, uh, I think he's singing with Blood Clot now, but he was a singer in the bank, all the Cro-Mags. Um, and it's a, a book called The PMA Fact. I've got, in, I've always been a little bit interested in this kind of self-development, making yourself a little bit better. But it was like if I wasn't allowed a music one, um, I, would, I would do that. And, but, yeah, that would be my book. What's your book, yeah. then? Um, well, like you, I did toy with the idea of the Guitar Handbook by Ralph Denyer. Um, I've had – the, there was two editions of it. It's sadly out of print nowadays. Um, but um, I decided to go for a novel. Um, it's oh. by my favourite author, uh, a chap called Robert Goddard. All right, never heard of him. And, well, let me just, um, I've got a tab open here with an Amazon on it, because uh, I knew I would never remember uh, the, the exact blurb. Uh, but basically, here's what it says on the back cover of the book. It says, six months after the sudden death of her husband, Leonora Galloway sets out on a trip to France with her daughter Penelope. At last, the time has come when secrets can be shared and explanations begin. Leonora takes her daughter to the battlefields of World War I, where, the, where her father is commemorated on the Thiepval Monument. But the date of his death is surprising and reveals that Captain John Hallows cannot possibly have been Leonora's real father. This is, the only, this is only the start of a series of re revelations that span three generations of a distinguished aristocratic family who are not what they seem. Penelope must piece together a tale of war, of loss, of greed, deception and vice, and the perpetrator of a murder left unsolved for more than half a century. It's a thriller book, basically. Um, but what Goddard tends to do is he tends to write books that are, first of all, novels that happen to be thrillers. It's not like a, you know, like a David Baldacci or Lee Child novel. Nothing wrong with those. Enjoy those, read them all the time. But this, it's not like you never find yourself thinking... Why did that character do that? Oh, yes, because the plot requires them to do it. It's it's always you know kind of um, it spans out of the, um, the, the, the you know the, the well drawn characters and his books tend to be um, centered around people who get sucked into some dark secret from the past that people want to keep covered up and you know then before they know it they're in the thick of it and you know they're they're in the middle of some desperate kind of situation and you can't see your way out and it's it kind of goes on like that and um in pale battalions it's called it's set the, the present day the impale battalion is a great name for a metal band isn't it <laughs> or at least a metal song i could get a tune out with that <laughs> it's set in 1987 that's when the kind of present day is in the book 
and it keeps kind of flashing back to the First World War and various intervening periods in history. Fantastic book, uh, brilliantly written, believable characters and a plot and an ending that will surprise you. So that would be my book. What would your luxury be? Oh, God, it came to me the other, uh, like, I think it was yesterday, and I forgot to write it down. Oh, I'm not interested in a bloody luxury, really, you know what I mean? I don't want an endless supply of beer, because I know I'll be able to make that if there's fresh water. I can do that myself. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> the only thing I put here is I put a luxury. Not that bothered, a decent comb, I reckon. You know, you <laughs> think as well. <laughs> um, Honestly, it's like it's something stupid, but I, I don't know. I honestly don't know, John. I wouldn't. Um, uh, I, I'm not that bothered about them kind of things. Would, would you take a guitar or would you take a bass? Bass. Fair enough. Fair enough. It would be um, a guitar for me. But my luxury, uh, you just actually mentioned it. Um, basically, if I'm allowed. And I am because it's my game and I choose the rules. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to take with me um, the Golden Rule from Smithy Brow in Ambleside, a pub I used to drink in when I was a student. And um, if I could just kind of pick that pub, because there's an advert <laughs> on the telly at the moment where a, a, a couple have won the lottery and they take their favourite pub to the desert island with them. So that, I saw that advert. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I'd want the sun in. Um, I drank in the sun in since I was 15. It was absolutely class. I got on my 18th birthday, um, Meg the landlady and Graham the barman took me in the back room and me and Graham got knacked because she thought it was my 21st. <laughs> <laughs> I've been drinking there since I was 15. Um, well, it, will the, it will be the golden rule in Ambleside uh, with a, a lifetime supply of Hartley's XB Best Bitter. Oh, nice. yeah. That would be my luxury and that... I think brings us to a close for today's proceedings. That was absolutely awesome. great fun, mate. Thanks for thanks for joining in with this. Yeah, uh, absolutely enjoyed it. Um, so uh, I tell you what, I better do my uh, my wind up spiel and um, thank the viewers for sticking with us for almost an hour now. Uh, so if you have been watching for almost an hour, thank you so much. Check out Steve's. Level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Check out Steve's channel, uh, 27D Productions. I'll link to that in the description when I put this up on the tube of you. And um, if you want to support this channel, all the links are also down in the description. But for now, I'll bid you all a good day and say thanks for watching. Look after yourselves. Stay well, stay safe, and above all, stay sane. See you next time. See you later, team. <laughs>